Hello, everyone. I um, want to welcome you to Southeast uh, Linux Fest, and this is the first time I've been here, and um, I'm really excited to be here. This looks like a really neat conference, and um, some of my friends have told me this conference is really fun, so I'm really glad, glad to be here. And I want this to be interactive, and um, if you guys want to ask questions, just yell at me. You can raise your hand if you feel like it, or you can just yell or make fun of me. That works really well, too. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm co-founder of a company here in town called Logical Advantage. Um, we were in business for 15 years, but uh, over the last summer we got acquired by uh, Pratt Miller, and I'm wearing their t-shirt today. Um, so now I've got all kinds of uh, bigger IoT opportunities with um, a much bigger company. And um, I'm president of Charlotte IoT, and I see a few members here of our group. And Charlotte IoT is an awesome group. I've got a couple of slides that I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, but you guys all need to join that group. And um, the regional internet of things, I'm on the board of, of that. Um, they're headquartered up in Raleigh, and they help economic development for the internet of things. And they're also really active with um, Charlotte IoT is a chapter of them, and uh, it's just really good um, uh, economic development for our region. Um, who here went to NC State? All right, yeah, awesome. Love to see some cool people in the audience. So um, yeah, I went, I went there too. And um, I'm a, a Microsoft Regional Director, which I don't know if you guys have ever heard of what that is. And um, there's like an NMVP, but a Regional Director, there's 150 of us globally. And um, we're um, supposed to be visionaries in the, in the field, but cross-platform and um, more of a business acumen. And I don't know why they really thought I had that, but um, I don't work for Microsoft. I don't direct anything, and um, I don't have a region. But um, it's a really, really neat title. Um, I'm an IoT junkie. I've done all kinds of uh, open source projects. Some of my work has, um, my articles have millions of views and like tens of thousands of, of downloads and whatnot um, from, from dating back almost 10 years ago. Um, my company, uh, Pratt Miller, we're hiring. And um, if you guys are cool people or you know cool people, then uh, please come talk to me afterwards. Right now, we're really desperate for some DevOps people and for some um, senior developers, but we also like any kind of developers. If you're a junior and whatnot, we'd, I'd love to talk to you, especially if you're here. If you're here, I know that I love you already. Um, Charlotte IoT is like the most awesome group. Um, I started it around five years ago, and we've grown to 1,700 people. We've got uh, evening uh, meetings the first Tuesday of the month, except for July, uh, because of the 4th of July, it's the second Tuesday. Um, we've done 80 events, and they're really good. They're all about learning. Um, they're technical events. Um, we also do lunch and learns. Some of the lunch and learns are more towards the business side and, and marketing, um, but some of them are technical as well. Uh, we do about two lunch and learns a week and uh, evening meetings. And um, we stream live on YouTube. If you live on the north side of town, uh, we stream live to a location there, and if you're just on the internet, you can watch us on the internet. But what's really cool, too, is if you're at the meeting and you've got a question, you can go back later and, and watch the stream, watch the video. Um, and we do uh, STEM events and uh, really awesome civic hackathons. So we've got a big meeting coming up. Um, first, before I tell you about this one, I haven't posted it yet, but the July meeting is going to be on uh, cognitive services with um, Microsoft, and um, it's going to include the new um, Azure Connect. If you guys have used like the Connect for Xbox, um, this is going to be a, it's a new version of the Connect. It's, it'll be out in the um, September time frame, and it's not made for gaming. It's made for business applications and, and cognitive services, and it should be really good. And then our August meeting is going to be a, a big meeting at um, Livingston and Haven. It's on Bosch Rexroth. And Bosch is one of the bigger players in IoT, and they're flying in famous people um, to, to talk about Bosch sensors and, and the Bosch IoT suite. So it, it should be a great talk. And um, find us on Meetup. Uh, you guys all have phones, so I recommend everyone to come join our group now because um, it really is, um, I think, one of the best groups in town. And um, one other thing that we do that's really co cool in Charlotte IoT are civic hackathons. And um, so far, we've done five hackathons to help three people. And um, we're doing them in, in, like, like, we'll spend a weekend, and we'll do something that impacts someone, in some cases, pretty big ways. Um, 
Nick on the bottom here, he's a, a quadriplegic. He can't move anything below his neck. And um, so at night, he had to yell at his wife, honey, I'm hot. Can you please adjust the blanket or turn on the fan? And um, either that or it gets debilitating. You don't want to always have to rely on your, your spouse or family. And so you don't do it. And then you just suffer all night in heat and you can't sleep and it's miserable. So um, we found a, a blanket um, chili pad. They make it in uh, Mooresville. And, um, but this blanket, it, it pumps hot and cold water in it to heat or cool it. The problem is the controls are all manual. So what we did in the group is um, we wrote Alexa controls. So now he yells at the blanket instead of his wife you know, to, to heat or cool it. So, so that's really cool. And, and we've helped two other people with um, some projects as well. And, and sometimes we'll just buy um, commercial stuff and give it to them, like um, something to control their TV from speech. They don't have to watch Little House on the Prairie all day just because someone put it on the TV at the beginning. So um, things like that are really enabling and, and really epic. Um, um, and a cheap way to help somebody. And then um, this, we, we wrote open source in the group. And Jeremy Prophet, um, he's been leading the civic hackathons. He's a really awesome guy, if you don't know him. But um, here in town, he works for LendingTree. And he wrote some open source code around Alexa that ties in with the uh, particle platform. It works on the second generation stuff, the, the Photon. And I brought in a demo. The problem is my demo is not working now. But normally, I'd be like, Alexa, trick or treat. Okay. And some reason, she's not on Wi-Fi. I'll, I'll show you what she does. I'm going to cheat. <laughs> Pretend like Alexa made that happen. <laughs> so um, a, a project like that literally takes like um, less than an hour with the code that Jeremy wrote. It's just really easy to use. It, it works with Particle. And um, you can connect anything to Alexa now with this open source code. Um, and and it, it's, it's really amazing. And it's using the, um, the Smart Home Skill API. So with Alexa, you have the skill kit where you can like, configure intents. And then um, Alexa will figure out like, which intent are you trying to invoke and then call that function for it. That's another way of doing it. But if you do it with the API, the Smart Home API, then um, you can make routines and you can use like better natural language with the routines to um, you know, like say trick or treat or something like that to make Alexa do it. Um, so I have like tons of fun with Alexa. A lot of people use Alexa to tell the weather. But um, at home, I made a, um, a squirt gun. And at, I'll say, Alexa make it rain, and she'll point the squirt gun up in the air, and it literally comes raining down below on everyone, which is um, really cool. I think you want to hear the song. Ah. <laughs> so she can be a pain as well. <laughs> Alexa. So, um, I mean, she's not listening real well. I, I, I do a lot with Alexa to try to impress my wife. I don't know that one. Ah. I do a lot with her to impress my wife. And um, so, Alexa, who is Dan? Alexa, who is Dan? The smartest, most sexy man alive. He's also a really good dancer. I try really, really hard. Um, <laughs> she didn't find that too funny, so I made another one. Um, Alexa, who is Kim? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. But, but yeah, we have lots of fun with Alexa at home. And um, I made my own home automation system um, dating back probably about eight years ago. And it all started with um, a squirt gun where um, we just got a house with a pool and I'm working like way too much. I'm always in the office. And so I, I put a camera on it and streamed video to the phone where I could nail the kids from the office. And um, well, then I, was, I started to think about other ways of doing it. And um, I made like a, um, I used the, the Microsoft Connect. And I made a vision system to where I could point at the kids. And I've got all this code online. There's videos online of all this. And you just target the kids and, and um, lift up your arm to do the, the triggers. Some, some really fun projects um, that kind of got me into um, IoT. 
So um, everyone knows the common use cases with like uh, the Nest and um, all the commercial products. My company, uh, Logical Advantage, uh, we, we always were focused on mar uh, manufacturing and doing things um, around industry. And this is the fourth industrial revolution right now. And it's kind of an exciting time with AI and IoT to be alive because so much is going on. And um, I really feel like our company is like the major disruptor in town and really the major disruptor in the East Coast because we're doing things um, leveraging like um, OpenThread, which uh, Google invented it with the Nest. And um, we're using it in manufacturing and, and doing things easier and better and different. Um, and then Pratt Miller acquired us and they're a much bigger company. So now we've got um, hundreds of engineers that are like electrical and manufacturing and aerospace. We do a lot around Department of Defense and a lot around um, racing, um, headquartered in Michigan. And so now we're doing things like autonomous vehicles and, and working on some really uh, IoT projects on, on bigger scales. So I'm like really excited to be a part of that. Um, you know, the value of IoT, yes? Um, no. Yeah, well, uh, we, we do a lot of work with General Motors, but all around racing. Uh, the d autonomous vehicles that we're doing is all around um, Department of Defense work. Yeah, because there's so much regulation around autonomous vehicles, unless you get in the military side, and then you're just about um, killing people more efficiently and, and what? <laughs> um, it, stuff like that. So um, we do a lot with control. I mentioned the squirt gun. There's a, a picture of it. And um, like the picture on the right is an autonomous vehicle that, that we d developed. And, um, and then a lot with data. So the whole purpose of doing IoT in, in a lot of cases is to get data. You need data to, to manage the business. And without that, you can't make smart decisions. And, um, and so it's all about gathering data. I'm going to talk about a couple of my projects, um, some of my home projects. And then I'm going to move into um, some like industrial ones. And um, last weekend, I, I finally got around to um, building an autonomous boat for my pool. And um, I found there's already a couple products out there. The one on the left is like an RC controller. And it's not connected, and it's really dumb, and it rusts out. And I, I bought one. I, mean, I was going to uh, make that one autonomous, but it rusted on me and stopped, stopped working. It's more of a toy, but it, it was like really smart in the ideas and um, the way it can skim the water. And um, then I found the one on the right, which I, I didn't purchase because it's not smart. It's, it's just like a, a Roomba that goes in random patterns at the pool. Um, but what's really cool about it is it's solar power, so you don't need to change the batteries. And then like at night, it'll skim the water. And um, here's the picture of um, my boat. And um, I took off last Friday um, to do like all my honeydew projects. So I spent the whole week, in, uh, I did like all my honeydews on Friday, and then I spent all Saturday and Sunday making this boat. And um, the boat uses LIDAR, and uh, LIDAR um, is, is using, um, what's it called? Uh, the frequency of um, light and the phase shift um, so to figure out how far away the, uh, the walls are of the pool. And um, so it, is, um, it, it, it can see the, the walls, basically. It's um, solar powered, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. But um, I'm also using open thread on the boat to save power because Wi-Fi sucks the energy. And um, when, when Google invented Nest and um, they had a really smart thermostat, well, the, the next thing they, they needed was a smoke detector. And with a smoke detector, if you had to change the batteries every day or every couple of hours because it's on Wi-Fi, no one's going to want it. It's not going to work because it's just always down. And so um, that's why they... Um, they decided they needed open thread, and, and so it works really good for a lot of different applications, and um, we're lucky that they open sourced it, and so now anyone can leverage it. It's, it's really great. Um, with the boat, um, I'm going to make it Alexa controlled, but it's on the third generation particle platform, which is an ESP32 um, Adafruit um, feather form factor. And um, it doesn't work yet, so we need to do some work at Charlotte IoT. Yeah. Do you want to go into more depth about OpenThread and do you have to have a special router? Or? Yeah, OpenThread's amazing. Um, so I've got a lot more slides on it coming up, but um, it's its own network that um, it's IPv6, and you can use um, 
like a cellular gateway and have it totally segmented from your, your client's network. So like in, in manufacturing, we wouldn't want it on our, our customer's network um, because if you hack it, we don't want them to then be able to have access to like the rest of the enterprise. And so we set up a whole separate network. But um, if you guys do uh, web development, raise your hand if you're like a web developer. So yeah, there's a lot of cool folks in here. TLS, um, uh, you know, your, your common open uh, like, like HTTP and the things that you do on the web, you can all do from any node um, in OpenThread. It, it just works and it's, it's really, really awesome. So I'm going to be doing a few other things with the boat with analyzing the waves of the pool to detect people falling in and um, just like the pH and the temperature and that type of thing. Um, so I got the idea that um, you know, people can fall in the pool or animals can fall in the pool and um, why not have the boat detect it? And, um, and, and, and so I'm gonna be working on analyzing the waves to um, steer the boat towards someone who falls in and have it be like a life jacket that, that goes over towards the person is kind of one of my end goals. Um, here's the control systems. There, there's two types of systems. Um, and I've only done the, the LiDAR one now where it looks at the edge of the pool. And um, on Tuesday, I was testing it out and it was kind of working. And um, then it hit like a wave in the pool. And um, here's the boat. It's not designed, I've learned a design lesson, but here's what it looks like. And um, it's got like an acrylic lip. Well, the, the wave hit it and then it, um, it all of a sudden made it under and it started like steering underwater. And I found out that the, um, the mesh actually works underwater. Um, open thread, it, it worked pretty well. And <laughs> the boat would turn into a submarine and it was going. And um, so I, I, I like run over to my laptop and take over the controls and bring it up to the surface. And it was still working for like five minutes and then it died. Um, but then we had a hair dryer and I like dried it out. And 10 minutes later it was working again. So it's like, um, it's pretty resilient, the, the, um, the particle platform, the microcontroller, who would have thought it would survive underwater? And the motor controller, it, it um, got really corroded when it went under, but it still works. And um, I'm using some level shifters because um, the, the protocol you use to talk to the uh, LiDAR is um, a five volt uh, I squared C standard, but um, the microcontroller is 3.3 volts and my level shifters got fried, so I need to replace those but um, I think that's pretty good for um, being a submarine, only having to replace a couple parts. Uh, so if you look at this, um, there's two microcontrollers in the picture. There is the um, particle argon, that's the gateway, and it's extending the network over to the particle xeon. So the xeon um, won't use much power, and um, I'm going to have it all be solar powered, and this is going to go on top. To, to power everything, and I haven't done the power components yet, but that's what the plan is. And then I've got a little skirt that I just went and bought some fabric that's gonna skim the water. Okay. Um, so, Particle has, yes? No, that wasn't a good design. So um, yeah, it's, so I, I've built it to be like a really quick prototype um, as I tried to have it working over the weekend. Um, if I were to do it, or actually tomorrow what I'm gonna do is get some Tupperware and put all the electronics and the batteries in the Tupperware and then just the, the wires going to the motor, I'll go through a hole and, and seal it so it'll be a, a smarter design. And then I can make it more into a submarine. But. <laughs> Um, and I actually might even put a, a, a tilt on the acrylic to have it go into the water to make it go under, because it was really cool going under, um, kind of exciting. But <laughs> what is that? Yeah, that would be, <laughs> that's a sweet idea to try to skim up the leaves from the bottom. Yeah, awesome. So um, if you guys have done much with like the ESP32, there's the Adafruit feather form factor. It's a really common form factor. And the, the beauty is um, people make things, especially for makers with this form factor and like um, OLED displays and, and things like that. And so we started using this with our manufacturing projects 
and it made for really quick prototyping because we'll just buy something. Um, we'll buy like an SD card reader. We'll buy a, a display, like a seven inch display and, and plug it into this. And then all of a sudden we have something that, that we'll 3D print something and, and it looks really professional and um, we, we don't have a lot of effort into it. And it allows us to um, get data really quickly on whatever it is we're trying to, to do with the project. Um, and, and so the form factor is great. But Particle has these um, three nodes in the open thread mesh. And um, Nordic Semiconductor makes the um, system on a chip that does open thread. And then um, Particle has the, uh, the microcontroller and the Nordic um, system on a chip all combined, smashed into one unit that just makes it easy, which is why I can make an autonomous boat in a weekend, because their platform is like incredible. And um, they also have what's called over-the-air updates, so you can um, write your code and, and push it down to the device without being connected. So my boat's just floating around in the pool and I'm tweaking the code and I don't have to plug into it every five minutes. And um, like I can de deploy to the um, Argon, which is the Wi-Fi node, um, there's very little code on it. Mainly what you see on the Argon, um, this is my Argon here, is just a uh, blinking heartbeat. And um, on every project, I always put in a heartbeat just so you can see that the loop's running, the code's working. It gives you a really quick visual indication that, that things are okay. And um, so like when the boat goes under the water and comes back up and the heartbeat's still going, it's, it's pretty um, exciting. The boron um, is a cellular version of, of this. And um, Particle, I'd, I'd call it, they released an MVP where they don't have all of the issues worked out. And um, especially on the boron, the, um, the boron is like awesome. And if you're doing something maker-ish, then great. But if you're doing something that you have to rely on, um, stick with the argon for now and use like a MiFi um, to, if you need cellular, um, it, it's a lot more reliable. But um, once they fix all the issues with the boron, it'll, it'll be pretty awesome to um, extend the network. And one thing that Particle is working on is multiple gateways. So you could have it normally on Wi-Fi, and if the Wi-Fi is down, then it shifts over to the boron. So once they, once they get that worked out, it's going to be pretty incredible. And um, finally, they have the Xeon, and the Xeon is just a node on the mesh. And um, the network's extended onto the node, so you can do your HTTP calls, and um, you can do your TLS. You can, do anything a web developer would normally do, IPv6, and um, it, it's just pretty amazing that it, that it works. Here's what the um, architecture is, and the solar power is not done yet. So um, once I do the speech system, it, um, the Alexa, and, um, the skill kit, and the Lambda functions to, to control it, that'll be all part of AWS. Um, but first we have to um, fix the Charlotte IT open source to make it work on the third generation. And I might, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna fix it or I might just send um, Jeremy a message because he's so fast. He, Jeremy's amazing. If you guys don't know Jeremy Prophet with LendingTree, um, been really fun to work with. And then um, for the analytics, and um, I use um, IoT Hub a lot on the Azure stack, it, it, it works really easily for a lot of the, like the more cookie cutter IoT things if you need to ingest data, to read streams, to do things with the stream. It works really easily and then you can use um, Azure functions. If you guys uh, use like Lambda functions, um, it's just uh, Lambda, it's the same thing, um, Azure functions, serverless functions and save it in the database and, and whatnot. Um, it's a pretty common architecture that we use on a lot of our projects. So traditional like networking is all um, hub and spoke. And what I mean by that, there's, it's like a star pattern where everything has to talk to that um, Wi-Fi access point. And, and that's where open thread mesh is amazing because it can route between nodes. And then if a node is a, a router and the router goes down, well the network, the mesh senses this and another node will become a router. And um, you can have like a sleepy end node that um, it just wakes up and then sends a message, but you're, it's not going to be, um, normally you're not going to route messages through it because it's normally going to be asleep. And, and the open thread mesh is just smart and, um, and does all of this um, for you. So it, it's great. And you guys, a lot of you may have the Nest thermostat, so this is all Google and, and 
Um, they invented this and gave it to the world through open source. Um, any questions before I go on? Yes. Mm -mm. No. So um, the argon would be like a Wi-Fi gateway, and or you could have a boron, which would be a cellular gateway, and then you could have as many xeons in the network as you want. And and the xeons can do your HTTP stuff, and they're all IPv6 and have an IP address and and whatnot. So I'm working on. Um, few really fun projects now. Um, one is um, our pets. So we go on vacation. My wife is always worried, are the pets OK? And um, we've got a, a dog and a cat. And we've got another problem where the cat's always eating the dog food, the dog's always eating the cat food. And they're getting fat because they're not supposed to eat the other one's food. Um, and, and so I'm putting uh, beacons on the collars and uh, laser cut lids that will swing out when they come up to the lid. Um, and then also, like, what time do they eat? How many times in the day do they eat? I could measure, like, the amount of food. And, and then send notifications when things aren't right. Um, and then also the scoop to feed them, we're putting uh, beacons on so that um, when you feed them, we'll know that, like, we're on vacation, we know the kids are actually taking care of the animals. And we'll know the time that they are so we can say, hey, why didn't you feed them before 11 o'clock? Or whenever they wake up, probably more like 1. But... Um, <laughs> And um, the pool mentioned that. Um, I recently had like a leak at the pool, and I was spending so much time digging up. And while I'm out there, I'm listening to the filter system. And what I realized is I can hear when the sand filter is clogged or there's a couple other filters in there, and I can audibly hear them. And um, so I'm going to get some acoustic sensors and put them on the pipes and, and do some clustering to figure out um, you know, like, what's the health state of it? And then what that's going to allow us to do is we normally run the filter when my wife is at home because she can hear the issues. We'll run it when the power is cheapest and, um, and, and, and you just run it for like eight hours and, and whatnot. So that's going to be a really fun project. And um, we also just got a sleep by number bed. And, and all the work we're doing at Charlotte IoT is inspiring me to Alexify it, especially because my wife snores. And she's really loud, and um, I don't want to have to get out my phone or controls in the middle of the night. I want to just talk to the bed and um, say, Alexa, make Kim stop snoring, and it'll just like lift up, um, that type of thing. <laughs> a dump truck, yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah, a friend of mine actually made that for his kid. He used a hospital bed, and um, like he couldn't get his kid up in the morning. And, and so he, he just has like a phone app that it, the bed actually lifts up. And it's, it's made for like people who can't get out of bed, but it just dumps them on the floor. And he, he's got videos of that too. It's a pretty good idea. Okay. Some of the other fun projects I've done, um, I made tweet shirts that if you tweet our company, they'd light up and the, um, the squirt gun's really fun. One thing I forgot to mention with the squirt gun earlier is um, since there's a phone app to control it, if a friend's ever, like the kids have friends, and I'll, I'll line them up and tell them I'm taking their pictures and just like nail them, and it's a great for targeting them that way. And you can hardly tell, but um, there's blimps in the picture, and um, we put QR codes on the blimps, and we made it so you could steer it with your phone. And I'm hoping with Charlotte IoT, we're going to um, use Helium Network, and you guys may or may not heard of Helium, but they're a company out in Silicon Valley who, um, they're like well-funded with venture capital, and they're using blockchain, and they're um, making a system for smart cities to um, like cover scooters and things like that where um, you wouldn't need to be on cellular network because it, it kills the battery. Um, so hoping to put those on the Helium Network. Um, and, and actually have helium blimps. That'll be pretty cool. And one of the other fun projects I did at home was um, I make it so you can point to anything. This is all open source, um, and the vision system detects a vector out the arm, and can, it can tell like inches, an inch apart between what are you pointing at. It's pretty remarkable. And a gesture turn it on, and a gesture to turn it off. But while I was programming that, the cat crawls into the fireplace 
and um, I'm like frozen because if I do the wrong gesture, the fireplace is going to turn on. And <laughs> my wife, she loves the cat more than she loves the, um, like the home automation, and that would be the end of it. And um, so I've learned some safety tricks, and one of them is to put a mesh in front of the fireplace, and so now I can't burn the kitty. And, and luckily, I haven't, haven't done that yet. Uh, yeah, that was, that was before. Um, that was actually was years ago, and I used the .NET micro framework, which is pretty much extinct. It's been open sourced a long time ago, and um, no one uses it. Um, and I've been slowly rewriting a lot of my home automation to the, to the new stuff. Um, one also really cool thing, someone in Charlotte IoT, he and I, built a fog bubble machine, and you can see it with the, the bubbles on the right. But we used a, a vape, like um, what you, know, you can smoke with, and um, we fill it with um, fog solution that you buy at Walmart for Halloween and whatnot. And um, he did all the 3D printing designs, and like, it was awesome because every day he'd have a new iteration of something to test out. And, um, and then I worked on the controls and the Lambda functions to control it. And, and what we made was a really small device that there's a cat mask that goes over it, and um, the mouth is open, and, and the kids talk to it with Alexa, and it blows bubbles, and they'll pop their balloons from below. And that project's on Hackster.io if you guys want to make it, with, along with all the source code. Um, done a lot of other projects that, um, like dating back from 1993, that became products after the fact. So um, the, one of them, I think I had the first connected fireplace, which I mentioned with a cat. Um, and some cat toys, and, and I made a system called Alice um, that was a lot like Alexa, um, except for it didn't work very good. <laughs> um, so one day, the, um, the TV, my wife must have been watching Brady Bunch or something, and the TV turns on the fireplace and the garage door and the squirt gun, and I get home, and she's like, honey, you have to turn it off. And um, so then when um, Amazon came out with Alexa, I was so stoked because it doesn't do the false positives. It's, we've never had an accidental like fireplace come on or, or something like that. It's been really good. Um, with the particle platform, you can code it in VS Code. And VS Code is like a lightweight version of um, Visual Studio. And they have an extension called the, um, the Workbench. And particle has. Um, you have to install Node, and there's a CLI you use to send commands down um, through the serial port to the device. And if you guys do like Angular development or web development, you probably real or everyone in this room is probably real familiar with the CLI. But um, the Workbench also gives you function keys you can hit, and you type in particle, and then it lists all the different commands you can do, so you don't have to memorize what all the commands are. And um, the development is really um, really nice. There's also a web-based um, IDE for Particle, which is really good if you're like a student and you, you don't want to install like an IDE. You just can go in the browser and, and do it that way. But it's not nearly as powerful. If you're a real developer, you want to use Git and source code control. Um, you use like VS Code and the Particle Workbench is amazing. So there's lots of protocols for um, like radios and, and IoT, and they've been out a long time. And some of them are open source, some of them are proprietary. Um, Z-Wave's been out forever. And um, I didn't know it was supposed to be pri proprietary. And I bought this like really cheap modem from China and, um, and hacked it and figured out how I could control the lights with it. And then I published it all to be open source, not knowing it's supposed to be proprietary and that it's like supposed to be a secret and you're supposed to pay like two grand for the SDK and whatnot. Luckily, there are bigger fish to fry and they never went after me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Zigbee is another really common one. LoRa is one that um, has a lot of excitement. It's really popular in Europe. And um, you can, if you put it up on a tower, you can get maybe 20 miles, they advertise. But more realistically, around four miles. But you'll have um, really small messages you'll use with it. And what the idea with LoRa is, is if you buy an appliance or something like that, It'll already be on the network, so you don't have to put your SSID and your password in. You just buy it, it's already connected. Um, problem is, is that there's very few places that use it. Um, there's only like one tower in Charlotte. Um, but you can buy like a, a $30 ESP32 with a low raw um, antenna on it and make your own, but there's, there's not, just not many around. 
um, like there are in Europe. And, and is, but it's really a good technology. But it is more star technology where everything has to go back. There's no meshing with it like, like open thread. And then we mentioned helium. Helium is similar bandwidth and similar, um, doesn't take much power as low raw, um, but it's all open. And open thread is what I'm loving for manufacturing and home automation and, and um, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, you don't send many messages. Use something like um, Laura that uses it sips the power, and um, even my open thread. When um, I buy these smart batteries, it's sipping such little power the battery turns it off because it doesn't re even realize it's on. Um, but for if you want something to like, you're going to bury it in the ground under concrete or something like that, and you want it to last for years, then um, Laura would be a really good good one for that. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're, they're making, um, they're hoping that other people are going to make their hardware, but now they're making a hardware um, like access point, and you, it's kind of expensive. It's like 500 bucks, and you'll buy it, but then you get paid when um, like the scooters use a transaction if you get enough scooters to go by, and they also will pay you for extending the network. So if you're somewhere on the fringe and you can mine tokens with um, the blockchain, and um, they'll, they'll pay you because you're mining tokens. Um, but if you're like also in a strategic area on top of a building where you're providing huge value, you'll get paid more. Yeah, yeah, the FCC stuff. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, um, any questions before I move into some industrial type ones? So we're doing a project now for a company called Atlantic Packaging and they make um, stretch wrap. Um, anyone can make stretch wrap. It's kind of a commodity. So what they make is a product that is an IoT solution, and they actually had foresight for to see this 10 years ago where um, they, they used a PLC. They didn't use any uh, like microcontrollers and things like that, so it's really expensive to install, and um, the technology costs a lot of money. And um, what we're doing is replacing it all with open thread. And one of the big values of it is the installation is so quick because you don't have to run wires between all the devices. They all just talk over the mesh. And um, the problem we're trying to solve with the stretch wrap is to make sure that they have the optimal patterns and you don't use too much plastic. And um, if, if you have a failure, then you can have a huge spill, but you can also hurt somebody. And then have, that'll cost huge dollars. But you, you, you want to save every penny you can because you're making um, you know, thousands of these pallets and all these plants. And, and so um, we monitor um, all of the, the strep stretch machines. And, and these are really highly automated lines. And there's a, um, I've got a, a video. You can see how it like wraps around the um, pallet. So we're using LiDAR that gets the height so we know what's the height of the revolution. And you can look at the floor pattern to know when you're doing revolutions. But we also have like a proximity home position with another device that talks to it and, and a um, device that has a, an HMI display that just shows what's all the data from, from it. And um, using the particle platform and open thread mesh has it's allowed us to do it a lot less expensive than what any of the competition could do. Yeah. Yeah, um, not bad, um, but we've only tested it in one plant. Um, while we were developing this uh, two weeks ago, we um, were having really bad um, mesh issues where the um, connectivity was going out and the um, systems were locking up. And what we ended up doing was we built a simulator. And what the simulator would do is um, simulate the sensor. So our device thought it was talking to a sensor on the machine, and we didn't have to have a whole bunch of those machines in our office. We had, we had a simulated environment, and then we just would stress out the environment and, and see um, it would work. And we went from a 0% success rate in a 24-hour period to where it just never goes down. 
and, and a lot of it is um, this MVP, um, open thread mesh platform with Particle. They, there were some issues in the operating system and we were trying to code around any issues we would have and, and just do a reboot. You could um, reboot within like three seconds as a real-time operating system would come back up and, and start working again. So we'd t try to time our reboots like right after it finished the palette and some things like that. Um, but now the, um, the latest version of the OS, which isn't released yet, it fixed a, a lot of the open issues. It, it's working really good. <laughs> but the, um, the simulator was a really, um, uh, it really helped us a lot. And so we're going to start doing that on, on all of our projects. To, um, it allows us to do end-to-end -end testing. Because um, with IoT, you want to test just like you want to do unit tests with the rest of your code. This allows you to do end-to-end um, -end testing and allows us to develop the algorithms through the simulated data. We'll just um, monitor like um, a whole bunch of readings and then play back those readings through the standard buses that the sensors normally talk on. It's kind of a good idea. Here's what the um, architecture of that solution looks like. And it's, and it's actually kind of similar to the boat. It's using a much better um, LiDAR sensor. This one's like $150, and the one from my boat is um, like a $45 one. Um, and I, I forgot to mention earlier, there's sonar also. I've got one here somewhere. So like, I could have chosen to use something like this. Uh, it's ultrasonic sensor, and these are really cheap. They're like $4. And I'm actually going to test it out maybe um, and see how well this works compared to LiDAR uh, because you can have a $4 part or you can buy them in bulk for even less instead of a $45 part. Um, so hopefully these will work pretty good. Um, one thing I found with the sonar is it's not very reliable. Like if you take five different samples, you'll get a really high reading, a really low reading, and some kind of in the middle. So um, we'll do a sampling algorithm where we throw away a lot of the, the outliers and then do some averaging and things like that. But you can ping it um, hundreds of times in a second and um, make a pretty good average. I think it'll work pretty well. So um, with this architecture, probably the most important part is the OTA in the center. And um, we get OTA over there updates through the particle platform. First time I found out how valuable that was, was at Christmas time. I made a 20-foot tree. It's out in the yard. And it's winter, so it's snowing. Or it wasn't snowing. It was raining. And I'm sitting inside by the fireplace, coating it and sending the bits you know, over the air. It's like so nice you don't have to be there. And, um, but for like an industrial application where you've got hundreds or thousands of these and they're spread across countries, then you have to have a way to update the code. And um, it, it'd be a lot more important if we ever made bugs. But um, if you make bugs, you really want to have a way to update your code. And um, with a particle platform, you can push the OS update and your application update. Um, so you pick what version of the OS do you want. And um, so what we're doing is we'll simulate an environment, run a whole bunch of units on it, and make sure that it's stable before we like deploy it to a fleet. And um, I've got the picture of the barbarian because someone actually called us a barbarian when they were looking at a control panel that had some of our stuff in it. Because um, we're using like these really cheap microcontrollers and, and kind of changing the industry and doing it differently than everyone else. And I kind of like the barbarian, so I just start putting on the slides. Um, but yeah, our cheap uh, open source and microcontrollers is pretty fun. Any questions before we move on? Yeah, so um, with, with the particle platform and open thread, you can do anything you can normally do for um, authentication. So you can do um, like a token-based security system, any of your web-type security. Now, uh, a solution like particle is not going to be as uh, secure as other solutions. And, and so, um, or like the high-end ones that are way more expensive. So what we'll do is we'll put it on its own um, network. Uh, like this is on its own cellular network. And if you hack it, you don't have access to the enterprise. Um, and for this, we're not um, doing any of the controls. So if you hack it, you can't take over the controls and make bad quality. You can't hurt anybody. And um, 
And, and so um, that's our strategy on security on this. But um, there's other devices, and um, Microsoft has one that I'm real excited about. It's their Azure Sphere, and it's mostly open. And um, they all like the silicon design is is open, and and they're getting other manufacturers to manufacture it. And I've got one of those here. This is what the Azure Sphere looks like, and um, so this is like. This is the dev kit for it, and you notice it's like a lot bigger than the form factor of particle. But the chip on it is this chip here, and that's what Azure Sphere actually is. And um, they had a contest to see who could hack it, and if you could hack it, you'd get $100,000. And no one won that contest. But then um, someone from Microsoft um, who was like really familiar with the technology used, uh, peeled back the layer on the the microchip and use an electron microscope and was able to look at the flash memory and could hack it that way. Um, so <laughs> you can spend like a, a ton of money if you're a state sponsor, uh, you know, if you wanted to hack this, but it's all certificate based and there's a root of trust that you're only going to get access to one of them. You're not going to get access to the whole fleet. And um, so, yeah, it's real expensive to hack, but it's just one of them. And um, there's seven properties of security that that one handles, where the particle one will only do like maybe four. Um, and it measures like entropy. It has a random number generator, and it knows wh where the number should normally be. And if it if it's, it senses that it's off, then then it can um, roll back the OS or it can turn off and, and things like that. And one common attack that people do is they force like the device to roll back to an older version. And um, with this, once they, um, if, if they determine they have an older version, they actually burn fuses in the silicon, so you can't roll back to those older versions. Um, there's just a lot of stuff in there, but it is um, emerging and it doesn't fit a lot of um, applications. I just was up in Seattle um, a couple months ago and talking to them about it around like Department of Defense um, you can't control the radio on it through software to like, you don't want to be having the, the radio on, um, it gives away your position, things like that. And so um, they're actually pretty interested in, in learning from the community, um, especially with like our kind of projects because they're, they're small. We don't need like a million of these devices, we're just doing a proof of concept, but we need a few of them and, um, and, and so they're you know, going to work with companies like us to kind of build out the technology some. And I also think it's pretty cool that they don't have this, um, like, arrogant attitude that they're known for um, from back in the day. They've really changed things at Microsoft, and um, this is a, mostly it's an open platform where um, everything is open on it. And when it comes to security, you want to get those open systems. I tried my own to roll my own security, and I open sourced it. Um, but it was just me. Uh, you want to get like all the smart brains in and writing the best stuff. And, um, and, and if you do roll your own, um, don't make it open source because then it's like really easy for people to hack it. But you want, you want something that's using um, certificates and has a root of trust and, and has like a lot more brains and, and not just one clever person who's doing something. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, so in this, there's a real-time um, operating system. And what's really nice with that is they're always doing updates on it. And um, you don't have to deploy them. So that's the negative to Azure Sphere, is they, Microsoft has the attitude that if they know that there's a problem, they're going to push the update down, just like they do on PCs. And that's not going to fly for like um, Department of Defense because we need to test everything, and um, what if, it, if that version of the OS doesn't work, um, and we can't get it to work within, they give you like a two week span. Um, uh, so with Particle, um, you can actually test it on the, each version of the OS before you ship it down, um, which is a, a better strategy, I think. Anything else? Yeah, it takes the right kind of person to um, 
because there's, there's so many people out there who, like, who don't get the barbarian who's um, like doing it differently. But um, doing it differently has all kinds of advantages um, because the old hardened industrial systems, back when a lot of them were developed, they, they weren't thinking about security. And, and so you, if all of a sudden you start connecting your PLCs, you can hack the PLCs, you can hurt people. With us, um, especially if you're just doing a monitoring solution, it's totally separate logic. The control logic and the monitoring logic is separate. You hack the monitoring logic, you don't have access to the control logic. And um, that's like a typical form of segmentation. So if you'd need to do um, control logic, maybe use a separate um, processor for that and maybe not connect it so you, you don't expose the risk for it. And, and something else, um, all the crap you guys have bought at home, like your thermometers and, and things like that, um, throw them away um, because like if you've had them for more than like five years, you don't keep a cell phone for more than five years and the hackers evolve and the technology evolves and, and back then people weren't thinking of things. Um, there was a um, fish tank in a casino that um, they just wanted to monitor the temperature of the fish tank and um, because they put that in there, they were able to hack it and get access to the network. Well, same thing at your house. So um, one thing you can also do is um, if you have like a guest network, make sure you put it on your guest network so you have a little bit of segmentation um, between that and the rest of your network. There's some basic things like that you can do, but um, we can do similar types of things with the industry stuff and, and also just get rid of the old crap. Yeah. Did that get your question? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, here's a pretty cool project we did for a thread manufacturer in um, Laurenburg. And basically, they've got 3,000 of these um, spindles that just spin. And um, what they wanted to know is their utilization of the factory. Um, they want to be able to make decisions. Um, how's the best way to staff the factory in this zone? How many people do we put? How do we do at break time when they're gone for 15 minutes and the machines are still running? Or um, they can run tests on third shift if they don't have any attendance and, and the machines just run. And these machines are like millions of dollars, so you don't want to make the wrong decisions and, and buy machines that you don't, you don't need. And um, so we, we basically just monitor the spindles and send the data into the cloud, and we give them the utilization data. And um, before this solution, they had guys and gals with clipboards that would just jot down, this is the utilization of all the equipment. And they found that um, they were off by at least 30%. And I don't blame any of them, because I know I couldn't do any better. I'd probably be off by 100%. That's, you know, when you do a mundane job and you have to walk from machine to machine to see what's the utilization, it's interesting to me also that all the machines already knew what their utilization were, but these are, in some cases, really old machines. Some of them were pre-World War II machines and um, not connected. And so um, that's where we, we made this. This is what the, the prototype looked like. And then this is what the final solution looks like. Is, um, it has 24 inputs. And so we use the exact same sensors that were already on the machine and already wired into the control logic. And we just measure the same voltages to know um, what they are. So we just have like a $50 board that you tack on the machines. And um, their electricians can, can wire it in. And um, the idea is if it doesn't work, don't call us, hit the reset button. And if it still doesn't work, don't call us, pick this up and throw it in the trash and, and buy a new one because they're $50 and it's less than our support. And, and um, that's been a good strategy. And um, we made a, um, I'll show you the user interface, a user interface on it so that when you plug this in, it talks to the cloud and says, who am I? And the cloud will be, I don't recognize you, um, blank um, blue. And so there's a, an LED on it that blinks different colors. And, and then on the, the mobile app, like I'm the one that's blinking blue, and we already mapped out their, their factory. So I'm on this, you pick from what machine are you on and what spindles are you monitoring. So it, it's a really easy way that they can provision it and, and put it on the machine without calling us. And one other thing is, is they had 24 different styles of machines. So like the traditional approach is 24 integrations or um, a lot of um, work to get like an open standard. 
Um, there's like OPC UA and some other ones that you could maybe do, but um, they don't want to touch these old machines. They don't even know if they have the right code on the PLCs, and they're afraid to, to update them to, to load something else on it. And um, if it's already working, then they but, but no one's afraid to wire in something that um, to the sensors already on the machine. So that's a, kind of a, a roadblock remover. So uh, our barbarian approach actually has a lot of advantages, especially on the um, brownfield older, older machines. Um, here's just a picture, and, and like you can see um, that spindle there, it's, it's pre-World War II style machine um, that's now connected and sending data into the cloud. This is what um, that architecture was. So earlier I talked about um, like, like um, sensor simulation and we're building a jump start kit that will make it easier for us to do these types of projects. And um, we're using the particle platform with the open thread mesh and we're also using simulators now for, for everything. And, and something else with open thread, it doesn't have a quality of service or an assured messages. So you can fire off a message. There's nothing that actually guarantees it makes it to the cloud. And so what we did is, um, is we have like what we call a publisher node, and that publisher node is just a Xeon. It's on the network that um, accumulates uh, messages, and each message we just store in a file on the SD card, and then we send it up in the cloud, and then we have an acknowledgement in the cloud. Once we get the acknowledgement, we delete the file and, and so that we don't miss any messages. And um, for something like StretchWrap, um, for them, it's, the data is their business. They don't want to miss like any any information. Um, for like the thread company, they don't care as much um, if they miss an hour or something like that. Um, so the different customers may care differently, but we're just putting in the SD cards and, and having like a kit, a standard kit that you can plug in common sensors for with the standard buses and things like that. And we'll test them out with our simulators. Um, the OTA, though, is, is some key if you guys are deploying anything to companies to make sure you, you have that capability. I think we got two minutes. Um, I, um, any questions? We'll just fill up the rest of the time with um, questions. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, my favorite, you can, people like different things, but um, if you haven't noticed, I really like the particle platform. I really like C, you can use classes and C++, um, and so that's what I lean to. I mean, Python's really popular for other folks. Um, I don't like that as much, but um, there's lots of different choices out there, and not saying mine's right, but... Um, What's that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the particle platform to me handles a lot of those problems for you because you can um, write your code and then you can flash it through the cloud to your devices. You can flash it to groups of devices. And um, they, they're really good with like the second generation product and the third generation for mesh, it's a little bit